a bit. Um, I want to talk to you guys today about some of the most common, um, I guess, traps in decision making and how to avoid them. Um, so, if you've ever heard the phrase, that's a no-brainer. Um, anybody heard the phrase? That, yeah, decision. Well, you're wrong. There's no such thing as a no-brainer. Um, our minds are constantly, constantly at work. They're constantly turning stuff over and always, always um, working, hopefully for us. But sometimes, unfortunately, uh, they work against us every once in a while. And um, they trip us up and they sometimes cause us to make bad decisions. Um, and uh, that's because of biases that exist out there and also because of mental distortions. And they can, they can send us down the wrong path. Um, so in this... Uh, presentation I want to share with you guys six traps of decision making, um, how to be aware of them, and maybe even some tips and tricks to possibly avoid them in the future. Um, so, and we talked about some of these in the past, and the thing about these are is it is about awareness. So there's probably, we could get up here every single week and talk about these, and someone will have a new aha moment, and someone will think of something differently, and hopefully apply that to their work. So I would just encourage you guys, we're going to go through six of these today, different biases, different distortions. Uh, anchoring, status quo, sunk cost, confirming evidence, framing, and recallability. Just pick one. Pick one that you want to focus on and maybe even one trick inside of that, honestly, because we're going to throw a lot at you and there's no way you're going to be able to do all of it. But if you just maybe focus on one at a time, I think we'll all be a better company and decision maker for it. Um, so first, let's start um, with anchoring. Um, so this is basically just giving a disproportionate weight to the first piece of information that we heard. So that could be maybe the, the first couple of sentences you heard in the kickoff. It could have been something you heard on NPR on the way in. It could be a statistic you read on a website the day before. It, it comes from a variety of sources. It hits us from every angle. And ultimately, it causes us to really focus on that piece of information and not see the greater whole. So um, there are some things to avoid uh, the anchoring trap. Um, some things to think about. So obviously we talk a lot about taking a different perspective. So pursuing another line of thought. And this could be as simple as asking yourself, what if? Um, so that you can really see the decision from a different perspective. And we talk a lot about integrated perspective and seeking the input of others. But one thing that you can do to avoid the anchoring bias is to actually not go to the, an, another person first. So you can actually, if you spend just a little bit of time thinking through the problem deeply on your own, uh, you can avoid maybe getting anchored by someone else's input out of the gate. Um, and that's why we built the space like we did, right? So we have spaces for you to have some deep zoning time in the zone rooms or in your workstation, but then you've got other places where you can go to like bounce ideas off people in a casual setting or in a more formal setting, like a workshop. Um, but it's important that you don't get anchored on someone else's idea. Uh, but then when it is time, uh, seeking perspective is super important. It widens your frame of reference. It invites fresh thinking. It's super valuable to avoid this bias. Um, but the, the worst thing you can do when you're going to seek perspective from someone else is not to listen. So if you're going to seek perspective from someone else and not anchor them, you need to just listen, take it all in. Otherwise, the way that you set up how they're going to give you feedback could absolutely anchor them on whatever you're thinking, and neither one of you would ever know it. Um, so that's the anchoring trap. Um, status quo. So we know this one very well. I think we're actually very good. At this one, maybe we're too good at this one, I don't know. Uh, but we have a core value that greets us every day when we walk in that says if we're not changing, we're dying. Oftentimes, we're just very, very averse to change. You know, as humans, we don't want to change. We don't want to, it's scary out there, um, whatever that next thing is that might be a, a decision that we make. But um, it doesn't mean it's the wrong decision. It's just different. And so there are some things we can do to help us decide whether or not we're just stuck in a rut or maybe we are doing the right thing and there isn't a reason to change. Um, the first of which is really thinking about the objective. So if you just take all other decisions out of the equation and just think about what are we currently doing, does it actually ladder up to the objective? Does it actually achieve what we're trying to achieve? If the answer is yes, maybe there's nothing more to be done there. Uh, but if the answer is no, think through your options. Do a pro and con list. What are the exhaustive options? You, you always have options. Creative people can always solve a problem more than one way. We hear that a lot from Tim. Um, and so just telling yourself that there are other options can sometimes be all it takes. Um, but oftentimes when we're thinking about the option and what it will take to change, we exaggerate what it will take to get us there. 
Um, and if you guys remember from my share from being on a medical leave, I talked about the baby steps and how oftentimes we think about steps and how small they have to be in order to get to the next level or to the new decision. But what I found personally was that was not the case. It just took a couple little steps to get you over that hump and then you would be on to the new plateau, whatever that looked like, really quickly. Um, so don't think about the next level as being such a daunting place. Don't exaggerate that to a point of paralyzation. And then finally, the worst thing you can do when you're thinking about all of the options is to get paralyzed by choice and then just revert back to the previous way of doing it. So if you're faced with a bunch of options and you just can't choose, don't automatically just stick with what you're doing because you got stuck and you couldn't choose. Find a way to get out of that sticky situation. Uh, and maybe you do need to stay where you are, but at least you need to force yourself to choose and not just to lean back on what you've already been doing. The third is the sunk cost bias. So as humans, we hate to be wrong. We hate to lose, we fear failure, and the loss of being wrong is so much worse than the gain of being right. And so oftentimes, we keep ourselves in a situation where we continue to make decisions based off of a previous decision because by not doing so, we would be admitting failure. And our bodies actually can't tell the difference between the fear of being wrong and the fear of getting eaten by a bear. Like, there's a lot of physiological responses that happen inside of us, and we're not evolved enough to be able to tell the difference on a subconscious level. So, it's tough. So, we really need to avoid clinging to our fall decisions just because that was the way that we did it before. Um, so, there are some things to avoid the sunk tra cost trap. Um, we can ask for the input of someone else that was not involved in the very first decision, the previous decision. So, oftentimes we just kind of blanket say, see Kaki! Um, and there are some traps you can fall into when you're seeking IP. You can actually send yourself down a whole other path. I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, but for the sunk, trap, the sunk cost trap, you really just want to make sure you're going to someone that wasn't involved and doesn't have an attachment to that first decision that you all made. Um, remind yourself that the best, the smartest, most talented people make mistakes. And when you can admit the mistake and make another decision that's not anchored on that mistake, you're opening up the opportunity for other people to fail and you're creating a culture where um, people are rewarded for the quality of their decision making but not necessarily for the quality of their outcomes. So when you can get really disciplined in your decision making process, you're just basically hedging your bets toward better outcomes. Um, so as Warren Buffett put it, he's a pretty rich dude, um, when you find yourself in a hole, the best thing you can do is stop digging. Um, so we all know blackjack, it's very tempting to double down, I'm going to get that back. But oftentimes that's just not the case, and that's the same um, as it goes for, for decision making in business. Um, number four is confirming evidence. Um, so this is all about seeking information that supports what we already believe. So this is why people keep Fox News on in their living room all day long, every day, and they just keep getting inundated with the same message over and over and over again, and they're not seeking other sources of media or influence. Um, so this is, this is a tough one because um, we tend to go to the safe places, right? Um, but really it's important to consider all of the evidence. So don't just seek out evidence that supports exactly what it is that you've already made up in your mind. Um, I'm guilty of it. You go to certain sources on, online or certain media sources and all you're trying to do is just back up what you think you already know. Um, you can ask someone to play devil's advocate. So this is a great one that you can do yourself or you can ask someone else to do, but basically you're saying, can you come up with a counter argument for this, please? Can you tell me what's the strongest reason to do something else? And all you're doing is just asking someone to play a role, a very defined role, and it doesn't need to be arbitrary to just pop up in the middle of a meeting, say, I'm the devil's advocate. No, give them that role from the beginning and ask them to think about another way to approach this. Um, and then finally, the, don't seek someone that you know is likely to agree with you. So we have our people in life, right? You have your, your trusted people that you go to when you need to feel good about Thing. They may not be the best person to go to when you're trying to make a tough decision. So just keep that in mind and go to the people that might challenge you a little bit. Framing! Um, so we think about this one a lot as it relates to research. So when we're building a survey and go to Nate and say, hey, are we framing up this question so that we get an answer that we already want to believe? And he'll be like, yeah, I would frame it up like this instead or you know, ask the question this way in your interviews for Deloitte or whatever that looks like. We think about it a lot when it comes to really specific primary research that we do for our clients, but the truth is the framing trap gets us all over the place. So the way that we actually state the problem, 
obviously influences what kind of an answer we get. And the most common way that people screw up the framing bias and they bring that into the equation is through by framing it as a gain or a loss. So there's like a common scenario where an insurance company is asked, hey, if you make this decision, you're going to be able to save the cargo on one barge and it's gonna, you're going to gain $200,000. There's another way to say it, really like, but if you do that same decision, you're going to lose the cargo on two other barges and it's worth $400,000 and you're going to lose that. Oftentimes, they will make a different decision when given those two exact same scenarios. In both scenarios, they're making the same amount of money and losing the same amount of money. Um, so one of the best things you can do to avoid that is really think in neutral terms. So if you're going to present that information to someone, present all of the information. And say you're going to gain 200 grand, you're going to save this barge, but you're going to lose 400 in the process. That's all the information, it's completely neutral, and you're not leaning them in one direction or the other. Um, just reframe, so always, always be reframing. Uh, if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. Um, so when you're at the end of your decision making process, ask yourself very specifically how your thinking might change if it were framed differently. Just give yourself that opportunity to see if a different and then when we try to make a recommendation, um, when, or excuse me, when others are making a recommendation, challenge their frame. So oftentimes they're so in, in it, you know, they're so into it, they oftentimes will frame things in a way that maybe isn't best for what they're trying to achieve. So be that person for them and say, hey, what if we frame that slightly differently? Would that make your decision different? And we can do that for each other. Finally, recallability. So this happens when we're overly influenced by past experiences, specifically trauma or the media. So the media is super guilty of making it so that we hear things over and over and over again. It's why people oftentimes exaggerate how many people die in a plane crash because when something like that happens, it gets put in our face all the time. Um, so it's really important that we um, examine all of our assumptions. So when we think we know something, that's probably the most dangerous place to be because oftentimes it's influenced by memory. And if it's influenced by memory, it oftentimes has a lot to do with the recallability trap. So the best thing to do um, is to question everything you think you know, and the best way to question it is by getting out all the facts and figures and saying, all right, here's the actual information, here are the statistics, here are the things that I know to be true, and that can help you get rid of the recallability trap. Um, so all of these are very dangerous. They're very dangerous traps. They can lead to some pretty crappy outcomes and decisions. Um, but in combination, just to make it even worse, it can be really even more dangerous. Um, so think about it like this. If you had like a really dramatic first impression that anchored your thinking, and then the next thing you did is you went out and you selectively sought out someone to confirm that exact same decision, you'd be doubling down on those biases and those traps, and it would be to an even worse decision.